welcome to lecture 2.7 so in the last uh, lecture we have derived analytical expressions for time domain specifications of step response of under damped second order system today uh, we will have a brief discussion on those specifications i'll be taking three specifications up the settling time the peak time and the percent overshoot so we'll be looking at uh, what is going to happen to these uh, uh, specifications if we change the pole locations as you know for the under damped second order system the pole locations are given by s1 s2 is equal to minus theta omega n plus minus j omega d so as we change these pole locations on the pole zero plot how will these specifications change okay so here's a plot from the uh, book. So uh, what it shows are constant settling timelines here. These two vertical lines are constant settling timelines. Uh, constant, constant settling timelines, constant peak timelines, which are horizontal lines and constant percent overshoot lines, which are radial lines. And it is obvious from uh, the expressions for uh, settling time, peak time, and percent overshoot, uh, because your settling time is given by four upon uh, zeta omega n. And since on the S plane, since on the S plane, the pole location is uh, minus theta omega n. So the settling time is going to remain constant if you move along the vertical line. That is, if you have, uh, if you have, for example, your pole location is here at some value of minus theta omega n, and the vertical value is, of course, going to be plus j omega d, this is one of the complex conjugate poles. If you move along this line, if you move along this line, your pole location is changing, but the settling time is remaining unchanged because zeta omega n is unchanged. So that is why this is called the constant settling timeline. The vertical lines would be constant settling timelines. So you have one vertical line corresponding to a settling time of TS1 and another vertical, vertical line corresponding to a settling time of TS2. In a similar way, horizontal lines would be constant uh, peak time lines because uh, the peak time expression is given by pi upon omega d. So for one value of omega d, uh, if, you, if you change the pole location, uh, you'll, you'll not be changing omega d. So if you move your pole from here to here, Although you're changing the pole location, but you're not changing omega d, that is why your peak time is going to remain constant. In a similar way, the radial lines, because we have seen that uh, the, the angle of uh, this complex number, which is the pole, is a function of only uh, zeta. And the, and the magnitude of this, if you write the complex number, if you write the pole, as uh, you write complex numbers in polar coordinates as r angle theta, the pole can be written as omega n under root of tan inverse uh, omega n under root of one minus zeta square, which is the vertical intercept, vertical line divided by the denominator, which is zeta omega n. So you see that the omega and omega and cancels out and the uh, the uh, uh, complex number is the angle is a function of only zeta so the angle is uh, has to be measured from has to be measured from this point so uh, so you can write the angle as 180 minus this angle right tan inverse of this so Basically, what I want to say is that the angle is only a function of theta. 
So if your zeta remains constant and your pole locations change, the angle will change. The angle will remain constant. So, uh, so if your if your complex, if your pole is somewhere, say for example here, and you want to change the pole location, you move up or you move down. Although you are changing the pole location, you are only changing. Uh, you are keeping zeta constant because you are moving along a constant radial line of a, of a particular angle, right? Theta. Uh, so the percent overshoot consequently uh, will remain unchanged. So that is why the radial lines are constant percent overshoot lines. What is changing as you move along these radial lines is only omega n. So this is one important discussion that I wanted to have. The other important thing is what is going to happen if you uh, if you change the pole locations. Like if you change omega d by moving the poles uh, vertically, because here your zeta omega n is constant. Uh, please remember that the envelope, the exponential envelope, is exponential minus zeta omega n t, right? So since zeta omega n is not changing, only omega d is changing, the response of one, two, and three, uh, uh, the three different pole locations which are, which have the same value of o zeta omega n, but different values of omega d would be like given in this figure where the envelope is actually, envelope is actually remaining the same, envelope is remaining the same, but inside the frequency of oscillation is increasing as you move from one to two to three. So you can see one is this one where the frequency, uh, where there is uh, less oscillation and this class where there is less oscillation and your two is this one. As you change the value of omega d, your frequency of oscillation increases, but the envelope remains the same and your three is this graph which is now you know more oscillatory in nature but your envelope remains the same envelope remains the same of course means that the settling time is also same if you do the do it the other way around that you move your uh, poles to the left of the imaginary axis uh, without changing their their uh, uh, y uh, or their imaginary path then what is going to happen is that the frequency is going to remain the same, but the envelope would change, right? The frequency of oscillation would remain the same. So your frequency of oscillation in both these two cases, as you see here, is the same. So they have the same time period, but the envelope is going to be different. The envelope for one is going to be sharper, right? For two, in this case, it's going to, in, the, in this case, it's going to settle down uh, faster as compared to one because the value of zeta omega n is more in case of two as compared to one, right? And since your omega d is same and your frequency is same, so you have constant values of uh, your peak time. So you can see that the peaks, the overshoots and the undershoots, they will be at the same time. In a similar way, there's one more uh, thing that you can see is that if you move along radial lines, the percent overshoot will remain the same and hence the response would be something like this, where you have the same percent overshoot uh, and in order to have the same percent overshoot but different values of uh, peak time, settling time uh, and everything else, your responses are going to be like this, one, two and three. So as the, as the as the uh, uh, pole locations change from one to two to three, what you're doing is you're uh, both increasing the frequency of oscillation and you're also uh, 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 decreasing uh, the uh, 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 zeta, uh, you're also increasing zeta omega n in the negative direction. So that is why as you increase the frequency of oscillation, the envelope here in this, case you see the frequency of oscillation is more in case of uh, three, less in case of two, and lesser in case of one. In a similar way, the envelope, if you see, would be uh, decreasing faster in case of three, and uh, would be decreasing slower in case of two, and would be slower in case of one. So these are some 
additional features that I wanted to talk about. There's one more thing and that is uh, a response with additional poles and zeros that I would like to uh, touch today. So what is going to happen if you have response with an additional pole? Additional pole means that your system is not actually a second order system, but a third order system, right? So suppose you have an order three system and you know it's like k omega n square f square plus twice zeta omega n s plus omega n square and there is one more real pole right suppose we call it s plus alpha alpha r so what is what is going to be the step response can you analyze this step response in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the response of the uh, second order system that we have already seen let us suppose this is under damped let's suppose this is under damped because we have seen the under damped response in more detail so can we quickly see what cs would be like so i i i can uh, write down the transfer function expansion for cs uh, partial fraction expansion for cs like this a plus b S plus theta omega n plus C omega d divided by S plus theta omega n whole square plus omega d whole square where of course your omega d is the undapped natural frequency which we have discussed in detail uh, like this and plus d divided by S plus alpha r. So, <clears throat> so this much is similar to what we had obtained earlier for the second order system and this term is additional because of the additional pole that we have now here so what is a ct going to be ct is going to be a uh, ut plus e to the power minus theta omega nt b cos omega dt plus c sin omega dt plus d e to the power minus alpha rt so this is the inverse Laplace transformation of the above partial fraction expansion. If you look at <clears throat> ut, ut is of course your here, this ut is your step function, unit step function. Now, if you look at this response, it is actually uh, uh, the under damped second, second order response plus an exponential term. An exponentially decaying term. So depending upon how quickly uh, this term is decaying and how big the value of this um, uh, uh, this number d here, either this response would uh, affect your second order response or it will have no effect on the second order response at all. So uh, let me show you the uh, uh, graph, the plot from the book. So you have three cases uh, in case your alpha uh, r is uh, close to the uh, two complex conjugate uh, pair, pole pair in case it is it is slightly away but still significant and in case three when it is uh, very far away from the complex conjugate pole pair. We are assuming the third pair pole alpha r to also be on the left half plane because we are assuming a stable response. So in, the, in in this case, we are sketching the three responses. The the second order response, uh, and the uh, the total response uh, here, and the second order response. Both of them we are uh, adding. So uh, in the first case, uh, uh, the 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 complex conjugate pole pair is uh, close. Uh, the the third pole alpha r is very close to the complex conjugate pole pair. So you are assuming. Uh, uh, that the uh, decay would not be very fast. It will be uh, similar to, uh, it will affect the second order response a lot. So what is going to happen when you add this decay to your uh, second order response, which is actually uh, here uh, like this. Okay, uh, let us take the third case first. The third case, because this will make it simpler. The third case is the one in which your, uh, in which your pole pair in which your uh, 
third additional pole is very far away. So when it is very far away, the term corresponding to this t exponential minus alpha r t, this alpha r is going to be very large. So this response is going to decay very fast and it is not going to be visible. So the author has not drawn it uh, here. Uh, the uh, here uh, the 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 response corresponding to the third pole is drawn here uh, in the in the bottom half of this graph. So he has not drawn the third case because the response is going to decay very fast. And what is going to happen? One more thing is that if alpha r is large, the value of this residue is also going to be small, right? And that is going to come from uh, the partial fraction expansion. So this, what is going to happen is that it is not going to affect our second order response because this is hardly visible at all. So our, our response when alpha r is very large, right, is going to be the third response that we have here, which is the typical second order response, which is given like this. This is the this is the overall response, this is the typical second order response. But if alpha r, r is not that far away from the uh, complex conjugate pole pair, it is closer to it in case two and more close in case one, then it is the, the exponential decay term case two, like uh, given like this, right? And case one uh, in which it is given like this, the exponential decay term is going to be significant and consequently the response of that we obtained earlier is going to be modified so it is not going to remain very true to the second order response and you have a response like this in case two and a response like this in case one right so uh, what i mean to basically say is that we have to follow a thumb rule in this and we have to see how how much is alpha r. If alpha r is greater than or greater than five times the negative real part, five times omega n, and then alpha r is ignored. This is a, a thumb rule. If it is uh, not that far away from the, uh, from the complex conjugate pole pair, then it cannot be ignored, right? So the response of the second order system with an additional pole is going to be uh, uh, similar to the response of the second order system if the additional pole is five time constants away or five times away from the uh, complex conjugate pole pair uh, from, the, uh, from the imaginary axis as the complex conjugate pole pair is right? Uh, that means it is far away from the complex conjugate pole pair. Then you can ignore the response and then you can say that the response of the system is similar to the res response of the second order system. Otherwise, the response is going to be different. Right? Now, what is going to happen if there is a zero? What is going to happen if there is an is zero? We have till now seen systems without a zero. So now you have uh, a system which is Say for example, k omega n square, s square plus twice zeta omega n s plus omega n square, and you have a zero, say s plus a, right? So, so what is the response of this system going to be to, uh, to a step input, right? So, so our, our, our CS, is going to be k omega n square s plus a s times s square plus twice zeta omega n s plus omega n square right and let us break this down into two parts so this is going to be k omega n square uh, s s square plus twice zeta omega n s plus omega n square uh, this is multiplied with a and then again this k omega n square s s square plus twice theta omega n s plus 
omega n square and this is multiplied with s so you can see that this response is actually this overall response cs is s times uh, let us call that uh, cus plus a times cus where uh, cus is the response of response of uh, a system without a zero without a zero so you can see that this is the response of a system uh, without a zero right these things in brackets and what you have is a times that response plus s times that response and if you do write this in time domain this means multiplying with s means uh, differentiating this so this is cut plus a times cut so your response is actually the so response of a system with an additional zero is equal to the response of the system uh, scaled up by a number a by the zero a plus the derivative of that response right so so if your response is uh, if your second order response is assuming your response is like this and your uh, your derivative term is small right if this is small if in comparison to a because a uh, a c u t is 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 large as the scaling is large the number a is large and the zero is uh, uh, is uh, s is equal to minus a is far away uh, from the uh, uh, j omega axis on on the left half plane then your response is just going to be a scaled up response of of your uh, original response it's just going to be similar to to this one so it's just going to be scaled up response right so uh, the second order response uh, can be approximated and the, the the response of the system with an additional zero can be approximated to be a times the response of the system uh, without a zero so it is just going to be a times cut but this is when your a is large but assuming your a is not large then what is going to happen now as a gets smaller and smaller the derivative term this term contributes more to the response and has a greater effect right for step responses the derivative term is generally is typically positive at the start of the response right so that's for a, for a small value of a we can expect more overshoot in the second order system right so what is going to happen is that uh, because this term is corresponding the cu dash t is significant and the derivative term is positive so what will happen is that uh, the response will contribute a uh, more overshoot to the second order system so normally if if your response is like this Uh, but you have a uh, but you have a zero uh, uh, at s is equal to a and the derivative term is significant as compared to a so you will have more overshoot you may expect a faster a quicker response with more overshoot right right something like this there's a, a one more uh, uh, twist to this suppose uh, a is negative suppose a is negative that is the pole is on the right half plane right so the a is negative means s is equal to minus a the the zero is at since a is negative the zero is somewhere here in the right half plane and what is going to happen since the uh, derivative term uh, is larger than the scaled response right Uh, we are assuming that a is negative and a is small also right a is small that means it is not very far away from the j omega axis now what is going to happen is that the response c cs which was uh, scs now plus acs now this a is negative Uh, and uh, suppose that this derivative term is um, 
larger than the scaled response then uh, then uh, what is going to happen is that your overall response is going to follow the derivative response first in the beginning and then it will follow the scaled response as the derivative term uh, you know reduces right uh, so what is going to happen is uh, your response is going to be something like this So basically, your A is negative. So you are expecting if there were if there had been no negative, uh, if there had been no derivative term, you you would have expect a response like this, right? Because your A is negative, uh, your CT, your CT is something like this, and you multiply this with minus A, you get something like this. But since you have a derivative term also present, and the rate of change of this derivative is positive, so it and this is more as compared to this so it will move the system first in the forward direction and then in the reverse direction so a system which has a response like this is called a non minimum phase system and this has applications in control engineering if you change the input direction that is instead of applying a positive step you apply a negative step then you get a get a response like this you just have to reverse this whole response if you apply a negative step your response is going to be like this so basically you are asking your system to move in the in in one direction it moves in the, that direction for some time and then it completely reverses the direction and moves in the positive direction so this is uh, a small discussion about the uh, effect of additional poles and zeros on the second order system thank you very much for listening